What I'm going to share with you tonight, you've probably heard many times, but maybe not always in the same way. So here's where I'm really going to begin. We're talking about choosing happiness. So who is responsible for my happiness? Just be honest with ourselves. Who is responsible for my happiness? I'm responsible, do you agree? Do we all agree? I am responsible for my happiness. Is that accurate? Yes. Thank you for coming. Are there any questions? <laughs> you see, if it's really true, and I agree with you, that I'm responsible for my happiness, I'm going to ask you if you can relate to the following. Do you remember when you were about 16, 17, you were saying to yourself, you know, when I graduate, I'm going to be so happy. Do you remember saying that to yourselves? You remember? You know, uh, when I go on my first date, I'll be so happy. You know, when I get out of this state, I'll be so happy. You know, when I get my first job, I'll be so happy. When I get out of, out of this job, I'll be so happy. You know, when I get married, I'll be so... When I get divorced, I'll be so happy. You know, when I have children, I'll be scared out of the house. I'll be so happy. Well, uh, uh, one second, excuse me, excuse me. If my happiness depends on my kids showing me more respect... You know, one hour of your chutzpah is more than I had in a lifetime to my parents. Now... I know there's no one here who can relate to any of this. Some of you have friends who know what I'm talking about. When I blame my kids for their lack of discipline or respect for me and make me unhappy as a parent, who have I defined as controlling my happiness? Myself or my child? If it's my spouse who has to show me more affection, more love, more respect, more understanding, and then I'll be happy in this marriage, who have I set up as controlling my happiness in my marriage? Is it me or my spouse? You hear the problem? If it's my bank manager who has to come through on the loan and then I'll be happy. If it's my boss who has to show me more appreciation, I bust my tail in this job. I do like the five employees working and this guy, he doesn't give me a raise in seven years. And who have I set up as controlling my happiness in my career, me or my boss? You hear the problem? We all agree, it's so obvious. I'm responsible for my happiness. Then why do I play the blame game of A, accusing, B, blaming, C, complaining, D, denying, E, giving excuses for why it's your fault that I'm not happy in my life, with my wife, with my spouse, in my house, with my health, in my wealth. I'm a poet, and I know it. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, if it's obvious, and it doesn't take more than a few seconds, yeah, of course I'm responsible for my happiness, then why am I so easily playing this blame game? So this is where we really get to the crux of what happiness is not. And then we can more easily home in very soon on what happiness really is. Because I think you will all agree that being that there's so much on the subject, many of us have seek out all types of different people to give us clarity in different areas of our lives where we're hoping that if I can improve my health or my career or my relationships, um, especially with my mother-in-law, um, <laughs> sorry, just swallowing, sorry, just swallowing, um, and my father-in-law, uh, my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, and, my, and my, my real sister, and my parents, and my kids, you know, as soon as I can improve the relationship with my boss, and my clients, and my chavrusa, and my neighbor, have I covered everybody? So I'm so busy looking for happiness in, in every area of my life. Is it possible that it's become extremely complex? When is it possible that in reality, and we're gonna talk about reality, it's extremely simple. But because it's simple, because it's so deceptively simple, it so easily gets missed. Because it was simple for all of us to agree, I'm responsible for my happiness, but nevertheless, I've got all these reasons why, until the relationship changes, until I lose weight, until I'm making more money, until I live in this zip code, until I build a house like this, until I can drive this car, until, and, and I keep going on and on and on. So the question begs, well, if happiness is simple, why is it so complicated? Why, why is there so much written about it? And so, even more recently, there's psychology, um, what's it called? Uh, positive psychology. So it's, it's a whole new trend in the world of psychology that's starting to recognize more and more the role of the mind in the pursuit of happiness. There's one professor, Tal Shaha, some of you are probably familiar with that name. 
He's actually an Iranian Jew, a uh, traditional Jew. He's retired now, he lives in, in Eretz Israel, but he was a professor in Harvard, and he had the largest attendance in Harvard University's history for his courses. They were labeled Happiness 101. 1,400 students. That might not sound very impressive to you, but I think the whole of Harvard is about three, 4,000 students, something like that. So, so to have 1,400 students out of the 4,000 turn up to your lectures as part of, wow, that's very impressive. But it's also a very big statement. We're, we're, we're all searching for more clarity on this apparently very complicated subject. So I'm going to share with you the following. And this is going to be the clincher. So if you want to fall asleep after this, you can. Um, and everything after this is really going to be explaining why this is reality, but you already know it. There is no happiness outside of you. It's impossible. I'm going to illustrate that. It's impossible for happiness to exist outside of us. I'll illustrate it. Um, I just met uh, uh, Godfrey tonight. I'm, we don't support the same team, but we're from the same uh, part of Lond uh, England. So, um, But I'm going to ask you, are you used to the English accent? So I'm going to switch now to a southern English accent. Can you handle that? OK, so um, two farmers in a pub. I apologize if you've heard this before, but if you even if you have, it's good Hazara, it's good review, and, it, and it's quite funny. That's my personal opinion. Um, two farmers in a pub enjoying a glass of beer together, and one says to the other, Ah, I want a million pounds. Oh, that'd be good. No, that'd be bad. I spent it all. Oh, that'd be bad. No, that'd be good. Bought myself an aeroplane. Oh, that'd be good. No, that'd be bad. It blew up in me there. Oh, that'd be bad. No, that'd be good. I jumped out just in time. Oh, that'd be good. No, that'd be bad. I forgot my parachute. <laughs> oh, that'd be bad. No, that'd be good. There was a haystack below. Oh, that'd be good. No, that'd be bad. There was a pitchfork sticking out the haystack. Oh, that'd be bad. No, that'd be good. I missed the pitchfork. Oh, that'd be good. No, that'd be bad. I missed the haystack. <laughs> oh, that'd be bad. No, that'd be good. I fell into an open grave. That'd be good. No, that'd be bad. The funeral men were filling it in. Oh, that'd be bad. No, that'd be good. I told them I was still alive. Oh, that'd be good. No, that'd be bad. They wouldn't believe me. See, life is one long story of that'd be good, that'd be bad. Marriage, oh, that'd be good, oh, that'd be bad. Someone once told me he's married 63 years, and he wants people to know that marriage is not a word, it's a sentence. <laughs> I am so impressed you didn't get that. A sentence as in jail, never mind. <laughs> wow, I am so impressed. I've never saw that before. <laughs> You just don't relate. Okay, fine. Life is one long story of that be good, that be bad. Marriage, that be good, that be good. Children, that be good, that be bad. Someone once asked if I ever hit my kids. I said, never hit my kids, except in self defense. <laughs> Health, that be good, that be bad. I had a friend whose doctor once told him he's got six months to live. But when he couldn't pay the doctor, he gave him another six months. <laughs> I think there might be a lot of doctors in the audience. I'm sorry about that one. <laughs> Life is one long story. That'd be good, that'd be bad. The question begs, so who's more happy? The one who's got more good than bad? Or is that just simply not reality? It's not reality. There's good and bad. It always, it's always like this. The question is not so much how much less or more good, bad, one person experiences it than the other. The question is, how will I respond? And where is that taking place? You see, happiness is never outside of us. I'm going to illustrate it in another way. Do you know anybody who loves their job? Pretend you know someone who loves their job. <laughs> yes, good. So now let me ask you. Uh, you know someone who really they love their job, they really love their job, um, but they're not making enough money. Could that sabotage their happiness, yes or no? OK, so let's pretend you know someone who's making an extraordinary amount of money, and, and he loves his job, but he has a very difficult marriage. Could that sabotage his happiness, yes or no? 
So let's pretend you know someone who's got the perfect job and he's making a ton of money, he's got the perfect marriage, but has a real difficult time with the children not going in the same direction as they were raised. Could that sabotage their happiness, yes or no? So let's pretend you know someone who's got perfect children and perfect job, perfect finances, perfect marriage, and has some health issues. Could that sabotage their happiness, yes or no? So let's pretend you know someone who's got perfect health, perfect finances, perfect job, perfect marriage, perfect children, uh, but has a really difficult time with a mother <clears throat> in law. <laughs> Could that sabotage the happiness, yes or no? So let's pretend you know somebody who's got the perfect parents in law. Someone once asked me for a definition of a dysfunctional family. I <laughs> said, so that's really easy. The definition of a dysfunctional family is any family with more than one member. <laughs> Pure humor, no reflection on reality whatsoever. So let's say you know someone who's got perfect finances, perfect health, perfect job, perfect marriage, perfect children, and perfect parents-in-law and extended family. Question, do you know anybody who's got all of that? I'll make the question much easier. Do you know anybody who's got all of that all the time? Never. How about, I'll make the question a little bit easier. Do you know anybody in world history who had all of that all the time? You see, what, we've ha what we have to face is happiness can never be outside of us because is it possible you could have someone who's not got the perfect marriage and is still choosing happiness? Is it possible to have a good marriage but financial pressure, stress, and still choose happiness? Is that possible? You see, what we've got to recognize is that in any situation we've been through, there are situations we've actually chosen happiness over and above whatever was the stress or the pressure or the pain of what we were going through. Is it possible that a person could have a physical condition that's not easy, often in pain, and is able to say, I'm happy. That's who we're celebrating tonight. So we've got to really get to the real crux of this. I said the crux before, but we've got to put it now under the microscope. If it's really true there's no happiness outside of me, then what I've really got to figure out is, so where is that happiness that when I do have it, where is it taking place? Is it in my pinky? Is it in my elbow? Is it in my knee? Where, where are we experience happiness when we do experience it? Where is that taking place? For those still awake. <laughs> it's taking place in my mind. What do we mean by that? What do we mean by that? The simple answer, and it really is simple, is happiness is a thought. End of lecture. Happiness is a thought. And it's the same thought of happiness that I could switch to interpreting what's happening outside of me as pain or suffering or it's your fault or you're hurting me. And what ends up happening, my mind goes from whatever it was that I'm thinking that makes me feel happy to whatever it is that's now making me think I'm upset or angry or stressed or anxious or fearful or hurt or pained. So I'm trying to make this really, I'm really put this together in a way that it's just, because there's so much I've got to untangle because I'll give you an example. Could I get stressed out from the traffic, yes or no? So here's the question. Is it really the traffic that's stressing me? How did the cars in front of me get into my mind and start pressing the buttons to get me stressed? Have you ever been in traffic where it's quite frustrating? You really just want to get home. It's been a very long day. Um, but the phone call you're on is so stimulating. It's so interesting, or just, you're just enjoying that person's company who's sitting with you in the car, and so the traffic doesn't matter. Is, is that a reality? So is it really the traffic that has any intrinsic power to make me feel stressed? Or is it not the traffic, but what I'm thinking about the traffic? And here's kind of 
to put it even, I hope, more clearly, you're not married to your husband. You're never married to your wife. You're only ever married to who you think he is, she is. That's simply reality. You and I don't experience the world outside in. We're living in Olam HaSheker, Olam HaDimyon, a world that is not really real, and it is an illusion, and God sets it up that way because the only place you and I truly exist is how am I thinking about what I'm going through? <coughs> so happiness can never be outside of me. It's got to always be here. David HaMelech said it this way. You'll find this in chapter 4, verse 8 of Tehillim. He says, Nasata simcha belibi. Natata is a language of the future, past, or present. Where is it? Natata, it happened already. Natata, you have gifted, you have given, same language of Natan, giving, as gifting. Natata simcha velibi. Now, unfortunately, thanks to Christians, and I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, we only translate the word lave as, as heart, but it doesn't mean that the vast majority of times. It can mean heart, but the vast majority of times, the word lave means mind, means thought. Lotisna etachicha belevavecha. Literally means, and this is not my words, Rabbi Victor Miller of a blessed man, we spoke about this many times, but in this particular case, I'm, I'm quoting from Sefer Haredim. Lotisna etachicha belevavecha. Don't hate your brother in your thoughts. Says Sefer Haredim, whenever the word lev is doubled over, levav is referring to both types of thinking. There's the Yetzer Toiv, which is Machshavah's Toivais, that's Lekut Moran from Rav Nachman Breslov, Torah number 49. The Yetzer Toiv is Hem HaMachshavah's Toivais. HaYetzer Hara, Hem HaMachshavah's Ra'as. The moment we, we go away from the Christian translation of evil inclination and just translate it for what it is. A Yetzer... It's from the language of Yitzar. Yitzar is a painter, a designer. A Yitzar is a designer. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God created in man two Yitzars. When he created us, he, did, he misspelled on purpose the word Yitzar Elkim. He spelt with two Yuds. It's not supposed to be spelt with two Yuds. So why is it spelt with two Yuds? So our sages tell us that when Moshe Benu said, Rebbe Shalom, why am I spelling this with two Yuds? Hashem said, because I'm, I have designed inside of you two ways of thinking. There's a Yetzir Taiv, there's good thinking, and there's a Yetzir there's negative thinking. I'm not talking about positive negative, I'm, I'm talking about reality and non-reality. So when I hate someone, it's non-reality. It's not just negative thinking, it's not true, it's not real. God says don't hate other people in your thoughts. When God tells me, love others like you love yourself, where does love take place? In your pinky, your elbow? You might feel it in certain parts of your body, but that's, that's because whatever we're focusing on is our reality. Is this making sense? Happiness is, is always over here. It's never anywhere else. You and I can say, look, but I'm, I've got so many blessings and they're outside of me. I've got a marriage, I've got children, grandchildren, I've got home, a career. So that means that when you're thinking about the blessings in your life, you're experiencing the emotion we call happiness. But it's actually not those physical or outside things that's causing the happiness, it's what you're thinking. You could have someone of the stature of Sarah Imenu, who's barren without child for 90 years. Years, that's a long time to wait. Every month, so blood. Next month, so next month, next month, maybe next month. And this goes on for years, 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 decades, decades, decades. That's not an easy life. She's kidnapped not once, but twice. She took on a co-wife. Ladies, have you ever considered that? She took on a co-wife to share with her husband. We're still paying the price of that. She did it, Baruch HaKodesh. Sarah Imenu, our matriarch, went through not all, but almost all the same tests as her husband. When they arrived in Eretz Canaan, it was the same Ra'av, the same famine for both of them. How does she stand up to all that? But you know, here's, here's what really doesn't make sense on the surface. If she would be here, Sarah Imenu, and be asked, Sarah Imenu, could you tell us in one sentence the encapsulation of your entire life? Well, how would you summarize your entire life? 
How, what would her answer be? It's shocking. Completely, utterly shocking. It's in chapter 23, verse 1. Vayeyu chaye Sarah. And the life of Sarah was mea shana, 100 years, esrim shana, and 20, v'sheva shanim, and 7 years, shnei chaye Sarah. These are the years of the life of Sarah. Rashi, quoting the Medrash Rabbah, immediately pounces on the grammatical construction of the verse, makes no sense. You, in, you introduced the verse saying, this is the life of Sarah, 100 years, 20, and 7 years, these are the years of life. Why are you saying these are life of years? We know it's the life of Sarah. You just said at the beginning of the verse. And so the Medrash tells us something quite remarkable. That if you ask Sarah Imenu, our matriarch, tell us what your life was all about. She would say it in three words. Kulam! All of them! Shavin! Were equally letova. Good. Whoa! Talk of denial. That's not a river in Egypt. It's when, no, never mind. It's, sorry, Menu, how can you say that your whole life, all your years were equally good? Kidnapped twice, barren 90 years. When Avram Avinu was thrown into the furnace, you, you were married to him. You just, see, Abraham, what do you mean? It's, it's, it's been thrown into a furnace. You went through what he went through. How can you say your entire life was equally good? And her answer is... Very simple. There's two ways to look at our life, outside in or inside out. Outside in, it's my mother-in-law, it's my brother, it's my parents, you know, they ruined my life. I'm, I really, I've been so traumatized by my, kids, my childhood. And that keeps me believing I'll never be able to recover fully. And Saramain was telling us, well, there's two ways of looking at everything. There's thinking that what's happening to me is the reality. And then there's a whole different way of looking at that and saying, what I think is the real me. So if I keep thinking about what I don't have in my life, whether it's the health, whether it's the wealth, whether it's family, whether it's extended family, whether it's marriage, whether it, whatever it is that I think is missing in my life, the more I think and think and think about it, I'm going to suffer from my Thinking. I'm not suffering from what's missing. I'm suffering from thinking about what's missing. D do, do you follow? It's, it sounds like a subtle play on the words. It's not. It's, the, it's between reality and non-reality. You and I always live over here. We never live outside there. But when I fall into the trap of believing that it's you who's ruining my life, what I have essentially done is given you power to control what I think. And because we only feel what we think, it's impossible to feel anything else. You and I, 100% of our lives, feel what we think. So the emotion of love, the emotion of happiness, the emotion of jealousy, whether it's positive or negative, doesn't make a difference which the emotion is. The emotion of anxiety, they are all thought in the moment. It's impossible for me to feel what I'm not thinking. I feel what I think 100% of my time. That's why the Torah uses the word lave, and it has two meanings. It means mind, and it means the icon of emotions. Most of the time it means mind, because that is really the starting point of what I'm feeling. Rabot mahashavot be levish. There are many thoughts in the... Where do you do your thinking? Your heart or your mind? Or you do your thinking up here? Oh, so when I'm focusing on the good in my spouse, the good in my children, the good in my health, the good in the blessings that God has showered upon me, oh, you're going to experience what you and I would call happiness, because that's the thought in that moment. But imagine if what I do is most of the time, or a lot of the time, not always, but a lot, I'm riddled with feelings of... Things people have said and done to me that really hurt me, and really upset me. I don't mean to belittle any of us that would feel this way, but here's the problem. I wouldn't even begin when my parents had <laughs> traumatized me in my youth, and my, my mother, and my father, my, and my brothers and sisters, they bullied me. I mean, the bully, I'm a scapegoat in my family. And I, I go on and on and on. And what ends up happening is that everything I'm telling you is thought in the moment that's coming out of my mouth. But 
the trauma or pain that I experienced in the past doesn't exist now. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's a memory. The only way a memory can come back alive, and it can't, but the only way it can almost come back alive is for me to remember it. So actually, what I'm doing when I'm talking about what you've done to me or hurt me or pained me or stressed me out, whatever it is, what I'm really doing is choosing unhappiness right now. I'm not making that bad. I'm just sharing reality. When I choose to talk about what it is that other people have done that's wrong and unfair or unjust in my life, or whether it's the fears that I have or the anxiety that I'm experiencing, what I'm really doing is thinking about that right now. Is this making sense? But here's the, the irony. Where do you and I exist? In the past, present, or future? Where do we exist? You and I can only ever exist in the, in the present. The past, mata hava hava. That, Hazal used that language many times. What happened, happens. History is gone. It's finished. The future never exists because as soon as I get there, it's already the present. The only moment I ever exist in is this moment now. And what we mean by that is not time. What we really mean by that is, what am I thinking right now? That's where we exist. So when I'm focused on the good in my spouse, in my wife, in my husband, it's not just positive thinking, it's reality thinking. I'll explain. We have a mitzvah, there's a lot of mitzvahs, 613. Out of 613, a lot of them have to do with how to think. Sefer Haredim counts 51 out of 613 relate to your mind. To be done l'chavzchus, to judge others favorably, where does that take place? Which part of your body? It's your mind. This is, very, this is a really interesting. You witnessed, you heard that person say something very nasty. It was an insult. Degrading. And it really was painful. And it was, and it was, and it was at me in front of other people. So I'm humiliated as well. I'm not taking away from that as a reality, but here's what's really amazing. The Torah actually tells me that I have a mitzvah to be done l'chavzchus, to judge other people favorably, which means the following. Even if you witness someone else saying or doing something that's not right, it's wrong, it's not even accurate. But there's anywhere in your creative imagination that you can come up with an interpretation that puts them into a favorable light. Of those two possibilities, one, what I heard and saw with my own eyes, my own ears. Two, option two, where in my creative imagination I could come up with a story that never really happened. Of those two, which is the Torah, God's mind, telling me to select? It's extraordinary. He tells me to select number two. Rabban Shalom, Master of the Universe, why are you doing that? I, I'm a witness, I heard a saw. Why are you telling me that I should come up with some sort of imaginative story that will put them into a better light? What's God's answer? Because that's more closer to reality than whatever you and I ever experience in this world. Because this world is olam hafuch, it's upside down. It's inside, it's, it's, it's olam adimion. It's an illusion. It's deliberately that way, it's not the real world. The real world is olam ha-emet. As Rabbi Septim has intimated earlier, this is olam ha-sheker. And you know what's really extraordinary about Alam Sheker? You never die. Your body gets buried in the ground. You, the real you, never dies. The real you is not your body. The real you is your seichel, your neshama, your mind. There's no difference. The neshama and the mind, the same thing. We actually say in Shulchan Aruch, in Simon Chaf Hay, in Aruchaim, in Sif Hay, over there, it tells us about wearing tefillin on the mayach, against uh, uh, the same, opposite the mayach. Why? Because that's where the neshama is. Even though the neshama fills the entire body, nevertheless, the controlled house, so to speak, is over here. So the real you is your neshama. The real you is your mind. Your mind can, no one can cut a mind. No one can pierce a mind. No one can stab a mind. You can't throw a bullet. You can't fire a bullet through a mind. The brain, yes, but not the mind. The mind exists forever. You are helik el kamimal. You are divine intelligence all the time. It's always there. But you see, the same thing that will make me realize, oh, happiness is a choice that takes place in thought. It's what am I thinking, what am I focused on? It's the same thoughts that will get me in trouble. So for example, I brought with me 
some of my thoughts. Here's one, anxiety. So I've got a lot of anxieties, especially with the, the traffic and trying to get here on time and uh, dealing with my kids' homework. And you know, I've got a lot of anxiety that relates to my health issues. Um, by the way, while I'm on the subject, here's one. Oh, my boss. Oh, my boss. Listen, you know, he's so unappreciated. I can't believe every time I work so hard. I bust my tail in this company. I get paid less than I put in as much work as five employees. I can't tell you. By the way, while I'm on the subject, Worry. I've got a lot of worries in my life. I've got, uh, you know, it's like a lot of them has to do with finances and also getting along with my, my mom and dad, especially in front of my kids. I really try to control myself. I really worry about what type of role model I'm providing for my children. And I'm getting a headache from thinking about all this. You see, these are thoughts that I'm carrying around with me. And um, I might feel very comfortable with you to talk about the stress in my life. So. I'm getting a lot of stress. I'm actually feeling it over here, and as she's it's going around my whole body, I'm starting to feel like stress everywhere. And these are thoughts that I could carry with me. I haven't got that many left. <laughs> Frustration. I'm really frustrated. You have no idea. I worked so hard for that exam, and I didn't get a pass mark. I put in almost a year. This is killing me. I'm so upset. I can't believe it. It gave me a, a, a failure. And whatever it is, frust. It doesn't, I'm just making these up as I go along, but <laughs> anger, oh, this is a biggie. You have no idea how many people I'm upset with. I got a lot of anger. I, I try very hard not to show it, but sometimes, you remind me you're just like your mother. And I, 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 and I just, it just comes up. See, here's the problem. I carry these with me. Oh gosh, I've still got three to go. <laughs> debt, my financial debt. Oh, that really, I, 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 you know what? Uh, it's like the moment I start relaxing, I start thinking about my debt, and it's really, really painful. Sorry, it's really painful thinking about my debt. And then my health issues. Oh, my dog teases, I'm overweight, and I've got high cholesterol. I'm a perfect candidate for cancer. I can't do this. I don't know. I'm such a slop when it comes to controlling my butt. And I'm just doing this so much that it's starting to really pull me down. My spouse, oh, I'll leave that one for some other time. <laughs> Don't get... and now, I'm carrying this around. And the problem is, when I get home, I start talking to my spouse about it. Sometimes my kids can hear it, and I'm banging myself with all these hammers. And it really is very painful. You have, uh, I, don't think, I hope you have no idea. And when I do this, then I get a call from a friend of mine. How are you doing? And I start pulling out the hammers. Now let me ask you, if it really hurts every time I talk about it, would you call me mentally healthy for bringing up when my, my close friends who I feel close enough to talk to about anything, they ask me how's things going and I start pulling out my hammers and beating myself. And do, do you understand what I'm, the metaphor I'm bringing out here? Nobody can do this to me unless it's my thoughts. There's nobody that's causing me anger or worry. It's me who's doing it to myself. I'll give you another illustration to kind of bring this home. You know, we're living in such incredible world of technology and advancements that I don't think it's too difficult to imagine the following, that technology has reached a point where your emotions are wirelessly connected to this technology. So it's the size of the face of a watch. And it's, it's, so, it's so advanced technology that um, if you press the H on the front of this technology, which stands for happiness, <laughs> you know, every happy thought you ever experienced in your life, every kind word that was ever said to you, every compliment, and every, every time someone just, just nice and all those memories start coming, flooding into your mind, you just really experience ecstasy. On the other side of this technology is a D button for depression. Every unkind word, every pain, insult, anything I ever experienced in my life, which was hurtful, is on this side. I can't do it, it really hurts. I can't do it anymore. Would you give this to your mother-in-law? Would you give this to your spouse, to your kids? <laughs> Why would I give the power of controlling my happiness or lack of to anybody? That's not healthy. And here's 
I keep calling it the clincher, we're always healthy. Because the moment I know the real truth, that the happiness is never outside of me. And if I do have happy children, happy spouse, healthy children, healthy spouse, happy marriage, extended family, those are more blessings, reasons for me to think about and pay attention to. But it's possible you could have someone who's got lots of blessings in their life and they're unhappy. And the problem is not the lack of blessings. The problem is that he's not paying attention. And this is where I pay attention. I'm not thinking about it. Howard Hughes, they made a movie out of him. I remember in Time magazine, when they reported the week of his passing, he died with $1.2 billion to his name. That may not sound like a lot by today's standards, but he was the wealthiest man who had died a self-made billionaire. He had $1.2 billion to his name, and in the last entry in his diary, the last day he lived, he wrote, I never remember a day in my life where I woke up and said, I'm happy today. OMG. He had 1.2 billion reasons to be happy. But if he's not counting, it's not going to work for him. How many reasons do we have to be happy? Well, when we're counting them, they'll count. You mean you can have a serious condition and people will ask you in an interview, um, what's your relationship to this condition? And he says, hey, it's great because it makes me unique. That's amazing. See, that's thought. You don't have to agree with that thought, but it's his reality. And in doing so, he's found a way to turn it into happiness. And most of the time, the words I heard was, were, his smile, his happiness was infectious. Those of you who knew him know the reality and the accuracy of that. But you and I might say, but how could you be happy in your physical disposition and uh, the particular condition that you have, and here's, you see, here's the answer. He wasn't thinking about it all the time. Sare Menu wasn't thinking about all the time what she doesn't have. She was busy with her husband, being the car of thousands of people. Eventually, when she was blessed with a child, she was busy raising the forefather of the Jewish nation. Yosef HaTzadik, in jail. For what? An accusation that wasn't true. He's 17 years old. And his beautiful woman is dressing three times a day to get his attention, and he refuses to give it. And then finally, when she's completely alone with him, no one else is around, he runs away, and what's his reward? 10 years, jail sentence. God added another two because he actually relied on someone else instead of God for getting him out. So he's in jail for 12 years. Is that a long time to think about how I got here? Well, I've been thinking about it. My brothers, my brothers. Their first plan was to kill me. Second plan was to throw me into a pit 40 feet deep, 20 arms, 40 feet deep. And plan C was let's make a buck on him and sell me. So I arrive and I'm completely isolated, totally cut off from my father, my beloved father, my mother. And here I am in Egypt. And I'm staying from, not easy. And what does God do? I do the right thing and he puts me in jail for 10 years. Would you and I say, hey, uh, I understand. You, I think you and I would say, hey, I understand. But that's not what he was busy thinking about. He dropped all those thoughts. He got rid of them. His mind wasn't there. If you didn't go through your mind with a turmoil on Friday afternoon saying, shall I keep Shabbos or not? Shall I keep Shabbos or not? If you didn't go through that, Shabbos is not a Nisayan for you. You know why? Because you don't think about it. If you're not thinking about putting on fill-in yes or no tomorrow morning, it's not a Nisayan, it's not a test for you because you don't think about it. Avram Avinu had three days to think about what God just told him. 
take your son, I've got two. No, your only son, but they're all both only sons from two different wives. The one you love, I love both of them. Yitzhak, the son of Sarah. Okay, what should I do? And bring him up as an oila, as a offering on the mountain, I'll show you. Took three days to get there. No, it was, he didn't have a Rolls Royce, he didn't have a, a Maserati. He walked or went by camel. That's a long time to think. What was he thinking? So ladies and gentlemen, when you get a pop-up on your iPhone or Android or smartphone, not you personally, your non-Jewish neighbors, when they get a, 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 on, on their iPhone a pop-up, what options do you have? Two options. What are they? Explore or ignore, delete, delete. Your thoughts are pop-ups, literally. The first pop-up, you don't have that much responsibility for, but what you do next is your Bechira, is your free will. Most of us, you, you, know, you and I can't stop thinking. Try stop thinking in 10 seconds, 20 seconds, you can't. There'll be pop-ups all the time. What you do with a pop-up, oh, that's Bechira, that's your free will. Oh, so when you get a pop-up, life's hard, life's a battle. God wants me to pay attention to what I'm thinking because that's where I exist. How much of a complainer am I? How much do I spend my mind thinking about it's her fault, it's his fault. That's why I didn't get ahead in my life. And as real, as painful as trauma may seem to be, it doesn't equal me now. Your mind can change in a second because no matter how much pain I'm carrying around and it's heavy and it hurts every time I think about it, it doesn't equal the next moment because you and, I, you and I live in thought all the time and how long is the life of a thought? As long as you think it. So how far away are you from the next thought? One thought away. Really? Yeah, really. I could be in the middle of tremendous rage with my spouse. I can't stand it when you say that! Oh, so my, Michael, yes? Oh, really? Yes! What, in five minutes? Yeah, I'm, I'm just finishing up. A I'll be there in five minutes. Oh, amazing! Really? I'll be there. Bye. Oh, I don't think you appreciate this. Michael, I've been working like months and months. He's a client that, that he's the first time he's called me. I've been trying to close on a deal with him. It'll be the biggest commission I've ever made. And right in the middle of my rage with my wife or my kid or whoever it is I'm upset with, I see his name come up and he never calls me. And he says, hey, I'm ready to close on a deal. Can you meet me in five minutes around the corner? I'm saying, I'm saying yeah, I'll be, I'll be there. One second, if my anger has really consumed me, how do I switch so quickly to this phone call and I'm happy to hear from him and even more ecstatic to hear that he wants to close the deal? Why don't I just say, I can't, I'm angry, I'm so angry right now. Because that's not reality. Reality is you live one thought at a thought. You live one thought at a time, which means you're only ever one thought away from changing your mind. So no matter how many reasons for me to be unhappy I've been carrying, those are all memories. That's not who you are today. It never will be. I can change in a second, literally. And as crazy as it sounds, yeah, but I've got this track record of unhappiness. I've got a track record of anxiety. That's true, but the moment one starts to realize I exist over here, Happiness is never outside, of, it's never outside of me. Happiness is a thought, and that's why it's a choice. And because it's a choice, I'm never far away from making a different choice. It might not be easy for me because I've got this track record, a momentum of carrying these thoughts that, around. It's really hard for me to let go of them, but as soon as I start to realize, one second, this worry I have is thought in the moment, and it's hurting me. I'm getting a headache when I bang myself about my, talk about my boss. And when I think about my boss in the ways I speak about him, uh, it really gets me down. And when I think about my debt, it doesn't make me in a place where I can talk to myself about, so how can I spend less than I earn and free up the difference to pay down more of the debt instead of just servicing my debt with the minimum or somewhere close to the minimum every month. And the stress I experience is really thought in the moment. So the moment I start realizing, one second, these hammers are thoughts that are banging on my mind and hurting me. They really hurt. This one has to do with my health. 
And when I keep thinking that, it takes me away from the most obvious thought I should be focusing on, which is, okay, what can I do differently? What one item can I eat less of, or what can I do to improve my exercise so that I can expect a healthy and longer life? But as long as I'm thinking negative about whatever it is I'm going through in my life, anger, ooh, this is a biggie, then all it's doing is making me believe that outside is doing this to me. And it's never outside, because you and I only exist in one thought at a thought. So there's much to be said on this subject. Um, I'm going to close with a joke. But the, the bottom line is, happiness is a choice. And when we say it's a choice, we mean it's a thought in the moment. It doesn't mean there's going to be something that's going to make me unhappy later on. I can still experience anger, and I can still experience frustration, and anxiety, and fear. But knowing where it's truly coming from, self-generated, enables me to make a recovering decision, if you want to call it that, or a different thought much sooner. It's going to help me let go of the hammers that are banging on my mind and my emotions and making me feel unhappy. So before I get to my joke, any of you know or knew survivors of the Holocaust? Were they known for going around all day talking about the Holocaust, talking about the trauma that they lived through, survived for one, two, three years, four years, five solid years of constant death, torture, trauma, isolation, loss of family? And why weren't they talking about it? You know, isn't it incredible that two survivors who didn't know each other before during the war, but after the war they married, and both of them had been through the Holocaust, didn't talk about it with each other? I and mean, sometimes they would joke in the mornings, they would both remember each other hearing the other one having nightmares and horrific memories, and they would, they would chepper with each other, which camp were you in last night? but they wouldn't talk about it. Not until decades and decades and decades later when the kids all married. And if you ask them, why not? So some people might say it was too painful to talk about. But you know what the most amazing answer is? I was busy building my life again. I was busy building family. I was busy building my business. I was bu busy building community. Yes, she Wow. I wasn't thinking about it. Interesting. You see, what we think about is our reality. So if I really want to experience more happiness, where should I begin? By trying to change my teenager? Very funny. <laughs> change my spouse? Yeah. How many of you know of someone who successfully changed their spouse by trying to change them? I'll make the question much easier. How many of you know of someone in world history that succeeded in changing their spouse by trying to change them. Nobody ever changes anybody. You might be able to inspire, give them information, they can make a better choice based on your role modeling, but the only person you and I were ever created to change was the only person we're capable of changing. And that starts with, what am I thinking? And when I think differently, I end up feeling differently because what you think is what you're feeling all the time. You feel what you think all the time. It's impossible to divorce the two. That's why the word late actually means both. Primarily thought, because that's the genesis. That's the starting point. So I'm going to close, and I do mean it, on a joke about three mothers. And I apologize again if you've heard this before, but um, if you have, uh, I hope the way that it's, it's said is uh, entertaining enough. Um, three mothers on... Uh, boardwalk and they they're sitting there in Florida um, boasting to each other about how much their son shows them respect on their birthday so Mrs. Koshlevsky is speaking to Mrs. Horowitz is speaking to Mrs. Cohen and Mrs. Koshlevsky says to Mrs. Horowitz you want I tell you what my son does for me on my birthday ah, you don't want to know but I tell you anyway my son on my birthday I get a knock on the door I open the door and there's my son six foot four tall and he's so tall he gives me a hug happy birthday destroy my ribs I open my eyes, 
and I see this stretch limo. How they stretch so far, I don't know how they stretch it. He takes me to the stretch limo to the most expensive kosher restaurant in Miami, and they're waiting for me. All my friends and family were at the birthday, but my son loved me so much. And Mrs. Mrs. Horvitz, how does your son show you respect on your birthday? Ah, he don't want to know. I tell you anyway, my son on my birthday, he taxes me to Miami Beach International and he charters the Concorde, just for me. He takes me on the Concorde, we arrive in London, uh, 2058 minutes later and there, he taxes me to the Ritz Hotel, the Ritz Hotel! This is for kings and queens and princes, he takes me to the Ritz Hotel. I arrive at the Ritz Hotel and they're waiting for me. It's all my family and friends from the whole world. We had a birthday party the whole weekend. My son showed me respect on my birthday. And they both turned to Mrs. Cohen, who everyone knows has no relationship with her son. They haven't been speaking for over a decade. And Mrs. Cohen, how does your son show you respect on your birthday? Ach, birthday, smashday, respect, respect. My son doesn't need no birthday to show me respect. My son pays $300 an hour, five times a week to his therapist, and all he talks about is me. <laughs> <laughs> I can spend my life, my mind, about who hurt me and why I'm not completely functional and why, when the reality is we're always healthy. The only unhealthiness is carrying this all. Oh, look, it may sound simple, but you see, you and I can't live in yesterday. It's impossible. You and I can only live in the thought in the moment, which means we're always one thought away from letting go and moving forward and cherishing memories about someone who got it. Life is joyful, full of joy. Focusing on what's good. Hey, does that mean that there wasn't pain? No, there was pain. And he was real about when it was painful. But he was still happy. I heard from Minty that even when he was in pain, he was still happy. Is that right? Isn't that extraordinary? Even when you're feeling down, but doesn't suddenly cancel the happiness. Because feeling bad about myself, hey, that can just be the reality for now. But the moment you let go, you're back to God is good. Life is good. Sara Menu honestly meant my life is extremely meaningful because she was talking about what was going on over here, not what was going on over there. That's not what she's thinking about all day long. That's reality. Reality, happiness is a choice because it's a thought which we control. Nobody controls our thoughts. When we fall into the trap of thinking, you're making me mad, you're making me angry, you're making me frustrated, you've been doing this for years, that's because I've given them the power to press this technology. Don't give it away. You can't, even if you try. It's just I'm not being honest with myself when I say it's your fault. Because it isn't. It's never. It's always what I'm thinking right now. The greatest minds can have been even having had the biggest adversity in their lives were able to get beyond the adversity. Not because they had the support and finances is because of what they're thinking. That is who we always are. And it's never too late to go to the next thought. In the merit of knowing that, may all our efforts to choose more happiness deliberately in our lives be as a chut to Shmuel Feivel, Feivel Shmuel, thank you, Ben David and Mindy, uh, and, and may we all be zorcha to much happiness in our lives and our families, amen.